So the majority of ordinary time, as I like to do, I like to preach on the first reading with the assumption that many of you are faithful, daily going Catholics and are very familiar with the Gospels and hear the Gospels often. We often don't hear the, you know, what the first reading is all about and we're not as familiar with the other books in the Bible. Uh, and so as we enter into the seventh week of ordinary time, we, uh, the church gives us the cycle from the letter of St. James. And unfortunately, we kind of picked up towards the end of it. So I think this week we'll conclude with St. James and we'll move on to another book. So quickly, uh, which James is this? So there's three prominent Jameses in Scripture, okay? You have uh, what tradition calls James the Greater. This is uh, the James the Apostle who was also mentioned along with Peter and John. So these three individuals, Peter, James, and John, would have been the three that went with Jesus up to the mountain for his transfiguration. And these were the three that Jesus brought with him in his agony in the garden. It is not James the Greater, okay, as the author of this letter. There's also James the Lesser, okay, and why is he called Lesser? Because the only time he's mentioned in the Gospels is in the list of the Apostles. We don't hear anything else from him. He has no lines in Scripture. We don't hear what he does. We just know that in the group of the 12 Apostles, we have James the Greater, okay, who's the brother of John, one of the big three, and then we have another James, okay, which again, tradition calls James the Lesser, who's not mentioned anywhere else besides just being named in the list. It's not him either, okay? Then we have James, the brother of our Lord, and this is the one who often many people associate with the writer of this letter. He's more prominent in the Acts of the Apostles. So after Peter declares that the, the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised to be saved, okay, that big controversy in the Council of Jerusalem, it is this James who then speaks up and gives to his fellow Jews, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, a list of instructions on how to go about Peter's decision, okay? And so that's the author of this letter, okay? So quickly, in, again, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, he begins with, Beloved, come now you who say. So he's changing topics. So yesterday's first reading was about division and argument amongst Christians within a church, which um, if you're ever part of any parish like this one, you know, sometimes these things can happen. People and groups can, can fight over spaces in the church and the social room and, uh, you know, uh, what type of music we're singing, you know, those types of things uh, common in any parish and every church. But these are things that cause division and need and must be avoided. Okay, so that was the topic yesterday. Today's topic, he says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we shall go into such and such a town, spend a year there, doing business, and make a profit. Okay, then he says, you have no idea what your life will be like tomorrow. So what's he getting at here? He's getting at Christians and others who spend their life making decisions based solely on wealth and making money. Now we do that all the time, okay? Myself included, even as a pastor, okay? Making money. That in itself is okay, but the problem is is that it's just, their decisions are just based on money and not seeking the will of God. So it's a topic that I've talked about several times before, that of practical atheism, meaning what? That we believe in God, but, and we go to church on Sundays, but the rest of the week we conduct our lives as if God is no active agent in it. We're not seeking his divine will. We don't pray, you know, God's will be done and all the decisions that we make in our life. So he's addressing those who are just, her, their life is just so consumed with consuming wealth and, and all the decisions that they make in their life is based just on that fact and that alone 
without any insight, input, or discernment into God's will in their life. That's what he's trying to tell the readers, and that's what he's trying to tell us. And then he tells us why that's a problem. For you are a puff of smoke that appears briefly and disappears. You know, just like the smoke that comes up from these candles, right? Especially when you distinguish them. It appears and then it just disappears. That is what our life is like. And I'm starting to realize that, you know, like time flies, right? You know, all of a sudden we were kids and, and now... And now we're old and every joint in our body hurts, <laughs> right? As it happened really fast. I can't help but think of also in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus gives like kind of a, a lesson, a parable, about a man who, who builds a bigger bar, a, a barn to, to store his wealth. And then what does Jesus say? You fool, you know, you spent your whole life accumulating and storing this wealth, but tonight your life will be demanded of you, you know? Like, like, life happens quick, and death comes upon us quick. And so being consumed with just wealth and, and not saying, okay, well, God, where, where do you want me to go today? Because there, there is a place he wants us to go, into heaven, into the blessed trinity. And so he says this, instead you should say, if the, will, if the Lord wills it, we shall live to do this or that. Okay? Everything based on God's will be done. But it's easy to fall into that trap of, you know, I need to make money here, I got to save for retirement here, I got to pay the bills here. It can be very easy and quickly to get caught up in that. Everything, if God's will it, then I'll do this or that. May God bless you.